Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Erin Perone. I am the co-chair of the uh, Benji Brooks Women in Surgery Committee for APSA. Um, and this event is sponsored by both the Benji Brooks Committee and the Wellness Committee. We uh, combined efforts to try to do an outreach to all of our members to allow um, a safe place to come together and talk about our jobs and our lives and how we support each other and how we can be better in the future. Um, one of the best things for me about pediatric surgery is I, for those who know me, I've wanted to be a pediatric surgeon since I was a third year medical student and was first introduced to pediatric surgery. I think it's just the most amazing job ever. We get to, you know, take someone's child and hopefully make them better. And we have really high highs, right? We have really great days where we get to really help and save lifetimes. Um, but there's also the really hard days, the days that kind of, you know, punch you in the gut and make you realize that they're not always great days. And those days are hard when we have complications or, you know, something just doesn't go exactly right. Like we think it will, and we feel responsibility and we have a really big weight. And so our goal is just to be open and honest about these. I think it's very normal. I think in uh, a lot of spaces, surgeons, we're supposed to just, you know, suck it up and deal with it and not talk about these things. Um, but that certainly um, doesn't help us to, to help each other and support each other. So it's a, obviously a very sensitive topic. Um, we are going to have some open communication later. We're going to plan to um, record the beginning of this session just because we have a lot of information that we want to have available to all of our members if they couldn't be here. We will stop recording after the information slides. So when we do start sharing, that will not be recorded. Um, so you can share as you feel. Um, and just remind everybody that this is obviously supposed to be a safe space um, and just respect each other and, and don't take the information that you hear you know, outside of, of our uh, community. Uh, so our kind of basic goals for tonight is to normalize kind of our individual suffering um, that we have when we have negative patient outcomes, to destigmatize any mental health support that we need, um, and to identify ways to seek help when needed and when to help each other if we see that somebody's struggling. So with that, I don't think she needs an introduction, but Dr. Mary Brandt um, has, uh, have a, has a presentation for us. Uh, I'm very excited to hear it. I've heard a little bit about it from our meetings, but I haven't yet seen it. Um, and uh, with that, I'll let her take it away. Wow, I'm uh, really so happy to be here and see some names of people. You know, we are finally learning how to actually have this connection over Zoom that, you know, two years ago, none of us would have thought this was possible, that we would actually see each other and feel each other's presence like this. So I think it's a small thing to appreciate as we get started. I am going to share my screen. Um, let me get this started. And then I have to move this to present. All right, let me just confirm. Oh, hold on. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, do, let me just confirm everybody can see that. Okay, I see some heads nodding. This is basically a lecture where to kind of set the stage for us to have some conversations later and to think about how to build a net strong enough to bear our suffering. That phrase and that concept comes from one of the professors I had, uh, as most of you know, I recently graduated with a Master of Divinity degree from Isle of School of Theology. And that professor is Dr. Carrie Doring. And this is a concept she developed really for pastoral care, obviously what she was teaching, but it's for any caregiver. When you are confronted with suffering in a patient, how do you create a net that holds that suffering without it hurting you? And then I think more importantly for us is how do we create that net for each other? How do we find the ways to support each other when we're spiritually and emotionally hurt by our work? So this is an artist's representation of Indra's net. And I don't know how many know about this. This is a, a common metaphor used in Hinduism and Buddhism. 
it, it's a metaphor for how we and actually everything in the universe is connected. And the idea is that every human being in this net is like a jewel and that we are at the intersection of the spaces in the net and that each of us as that jewel reflects and is reflected by every other jewel. So it ends up being a very powerful kind of visual metaphor for us to kind of get started with. So I believe the net strong enough to sustain us is made up of the connections between us, connections between people. And that's kind of, it's gonna be kind of obvious, but needless to say, that means it's more than two people because it, two people cannot make a net. And that intuitively makes sense. If we don't have the strength of other people supporting us, how can we return that strength? How can we sustain our strength to support our patients and each other? There's another important aspect to think about. If we want to create a net that's functional, that's strong enough to really support a heavy weight, it must be symmetrical. Each strand, each junction, each space has to be the same size and of equal weight and importance or the net won't function. And this is, therefore, when we think about this metaphorical net, this is a, a space with, that cannot be hierarchical. Everybody has to be the same at those junctions and those strands connecting us are the same. It's also important to remember that any net that's used regularly will tear. And an interesting aspect of the physics of nets is that once you tear a net, it continues to tear from the same place. And that hole just gets bigger and bigger. The lesson's clear, right? We have to stay vigilant of any connections that start to fray and quickly repair them. A net strong enough to bear our suffering is important. What we do is not easy. This is one of my favorite quotes that just sums it up. I haven't ever found a better one, but once we start our work, additional stressors include shift work, long work days, high case loads, time pressures, poor sleep habits, and high performance expectations, challenging patients, personal fears regarding competency, and changing roles in the workplace. In addition, physicians and trainees regularly face suffering, fear, failures, and death, as well as difficult interactions with patients, families, and other medical personnel. So how do we take a metaphor and use it to help us actually build this net, create this net, or mend it when it's torn? these strands that are the connections between us, what do we do to create them and to heal them when they break? I think there's five tools that we have to think about. The first is hospitality. So hospitality is defined as the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. It comes from the Latin word hospitalitas, which means receiving guests. And you have to remember at the time that this phrase first began, this was life-threatening. If you were on the road um, in, in, in the ancient world and didn't have a place to stay, you would die. And so people accepted people they didn't know as guests with hospitality in order to protect them and feed them and help them. This word, hospitalitas, is also the root of the words hotel, hospice, and hospital. So hospitality is more of a mindset and a way to look at how we welcome those who need us. Or as Joan Chittister puts it so well, hospitality is simply love on the loose. And in this place of hospitality, we can tell our stories to each other. But not just telling the story like the crazy case we just did when we walk in the surgeon's lounge. 
This is about storytelling to co-create meaning. Not just that the kid you've taken care of for years just died in the ICU, but the pain that created. It's the stories about the time that same kid came into your office in a Superman outfit, or the time his parents thanked you with a hug in the hall. <laughs> this is storytelling to make sense of the senseless, to co-create meaning with the person who is listening, really listening to you. As Dr. Doring puts in her, in her book, stories are about, quote, finding meanings and practices formed in the crucible of stress, suffering, and joy, as well as the ordinary tedium and goodness of life. And with these stories, we can lament. Lamentation is sorrowful, emotional, anger and pain. It's sadness so deep that the tears must flow. It is so hard for us to sit with someone who is lamenting. We're surgeons. We just want to fix it. We want to make it better. But this is a time to let go of trying to make it better and just listen and be with. Again, from Dr. Doring, stories allow people to lament with each other express anger and question all they know about life without imposing meanings prematurely. Which leads us to the fourth tool I think that's important, which is bearing witness. We bear witness when we sit with someone who is lamenting, when we write poetry or paint paintings, or when we bear witness in a more public way to about the injustices we experience and see in our world that others don't see. She feels no pain, shaved head, drugs and tubes. They file the report, pubic hairs in the diaper, blood where there shouldn't be blood. She arrives to prison, her boyfriend does too. He holds the limp hand, his daughter in jail, his son in this bed. They write the notes, answer the pages, and wish they could cry. Even in the midst of lamentation or stress or burnout, there is goodness. And in an unexpected turn of events, as we are forced to be fully present in the moments of suffering, of tragedy, of the things we experience, those moments of goodness somehow become more obvious. And so that leaves us with these five tools to think about as we go into our breakout sessions and we continue this conversation. Hospitality stories, bearing witness, lamentation, and finding the goodness of life. I hope I've provided a way to think about creating a net strong enough to bear suffering. But I know we also need practical ways to think about it. Beginning in January, you'll be hearing more about an innovative program from the Wellness Committee. In a nutshell, this will be a program and the infrastructure to support it, to help us all work to create support that will be meaningful and effective. For each of you and for all the members of APSA, we will provide training and support to help you reach out to five different people to create the kind of spaces we all need to tell stories, lament, bear witness, and search for life's goodness together. So thank you for letting me get us started tonight with just a couple of thoughts and maybe a framework for us to have the conversations that I know are gonna be so important for all of us. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much.
Dr. Brandt, that was great. Christy, I think you'll be next. Yes. Kim, can you put my slides up? Great. So I um, am going to be talking about some of the resources that are available. Um, I'm part of the wellness committee with Dr. Brandt. Um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So I'm gonna go over some self-assessment sites, some resources for substance abuse and suicide. And then some of the sites I think are the best bang for your buck have the kind of the greatest compilation of resources and then just some of my, pers my some personal recommendations at the end. Next slide. So I know we, we kind of feel burnt out, but there, there is a way to actually measure it. Um, probably the gold standard is the Mosaic burnout inventory, which costs about 20 bucks for an individual, but there's also group plans. And um, that's a, a 50 item survey. It takes about a half an hour and it measures uh, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization and personal accomplishments. And it also looks at areas in your work environment, which may be contributing to burnout and it gives you that assessment. There's also a mini Z burnout survey that the AMA has out. And this is free, but you need to email the results for an interpretation. And Stanford WellMD is a great site and that has self-assessments for professional fulfillment, burnout, self-valuation, sleep-related impairment and impact of work on personal relationships. And this site is free, but the assessment part, it just kind of gives you a little summation, a couple sentences and then some resources but it, it's not, I think, as thorough assessment as, as the MBI or the mini burnout survey. Next slide. So there um, have been several studies out in the last year that show that um, those experience, experiencing COVID-related stress um, have been consuming more drinks and have had a greater number of days drinking. And I think there was something recently in the New York Times today that there's been um, more drug overdoses also in the last year. So these are several sites that are resources for those struggling with substance abuse or addiction. Um, the IDAA is an international group of healthcare professionals who are recovering from alcohol abuse or an addiction. And the site has links for um, every state and many countries. Uh, the FSPHP, um, it provides information on programs for physicians suffering from addiction um, and mental health issues. And these programs provide an assessment and then um, help refer you to treatment. And then there's ongoing monitoring. So then you can go, then go back into practice. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration um, is helpful if you're looking for treatment for substance abuse, addiction, or mental health problems. You can put in a zip code and you know, what uh, problem you're seeking treatment for and it will give you a number of centers nearby. And then Rethinking Drink Drinking is an NIH site and it provides a self-assessment for you if you're concerned that maybe you're drinking too much. It, it has some questions that uh, it will ask you about your personal use and then resources for you to get help. Next slide. So about 400 physicians die by suicide every year. And I think it's important to put these resources out there for anyone who's seeking help. There's a, a hotline available 24 seven. Um, the AMA has a toolkit that um, addresses individual and organizational actions you can do to prevent physician suicide. Uh, it gives you some risk factors and warning signs and tells you how you can promote care seeking behaviors at your organization. And there's specific recs for those in leadership roles. And then the ACGME has a lot of uh, resources. Um, and this one I mentioned in particular is a toolkit for residency and fellowship programs that have unfortunately experienced a, a, a trainee suicide. And it tells you um, what your response should be and provides you with some, some scripts um, and how to communicate about the event, and then how to support residents and faculty. Uh, next slide. These are the sites I think overall have a lot of resources um, to look at the Stanford Medicine Well MD and PhD Center. Uh, Stanford uh, unfortunately had a, a, felt a graduate commit suicide several years ago, and after that their surgery department really revamped their wellness program, and so they have a, a, a very thorough uh, website with resources. 
And then the National Academy of Medicine has been working with the president of the ACGME and the AAMC on um, initiative for well-being. And they also have um, a lot of resources on supporting physicians during the COVID-19 outbreak. And then the ACS and ACGME um, also have a great list of resources. And in particular, the ACGME has not just you know, websites, but also has workshops that you can watch and podcasts, um, but you do need to sign up for an account. And next time, next slide. So these are my personal recommendations because I think sometimes you can lose yourself on all of these websites. And I think it's much better to lose yourself in a good book. So these are things, that, uh, two books that I recommend that focus on finding um, meaning in life and work. Um, and I think some of the reasons that we get burned out is because we lose that focus. We, we don't, we lose that, that meaning in our work and our life. Um, the first book, uh, When Breath Becomes Air, is about a Stanford neurosurgeon who's diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And he continues to work because he finds that uh, being a surgeon and taking care of a patient brings him meaning and purpose in life. And the second book is one I'm currently working on, and it's about a psychiatrist who survives several Nazi death camps during World War II. And he writes about why some people survive and some don't. And he kind of talks about that life is a quest for meaning, not about pleasure. And that although you cannot control what happens to you in life, you can control how you feel about it and what you do about it. Next slide. So I just want to thank uh, Benji Brooks, Aaron, and Ileana for inviting me to uh, talk. And then the wellness committee, Dr. Brandt, Dr. Heiss, Dr. Buckmiller. And that's it. And those slides, um, if you like them, uh, Kim can send them out to you. Thanks so much, Kristen. Ileana? So I was going to talk about how social media can help you build connections that maybe you wouldn't have thought. And so over the past few years, maybe you've had some ups and downs. I would imagine all of us have. Um, for me, social media has connected me to people I wouldn't have necessarily run into otherwise, or even ideas or ways of thinking. Um, when Christy just mentioned about all these resources and websites that you can go to, something that I find missing is like the human interaction to it. And for me, that's, that's where it, the growth and like the real incorporation of the ideas and just discussing with with people who are interested in these sorts of things as well has helped provide some stability in some unstable times. So uh, I was going to first talk about how social media can support the ups. So where to look for inspiration and to share your passion. So I, I remember looking around being like, where are the people who like to do X, Y, or Z? Like they're, not, they're just not around here with me in this environment. Where are they? And I just maybe was looking in the wrong place. So when I went to go to social media, I found that there are, of course, people who are interested in the same thing, but then even more specifically, that there are doctors and surgeons who are also interested in a number of variety of things. So to list a few groups I found over the past couple of years, there's like coaching and empowerment, real estate, creative arts, multidimensional living, fitness, negotiations, uh, reading for fun and book clubs, mindfulness, business, writing for pleasure, um, financial investing, parenting, fashion, dancing, travel, cooking. There's so many things, so many groups of physicians just sharing the things that bring them joy. And then I've also found that in those groups, if there's someone who you've connected with or someone whose stuff that you like, they will also lead you to other things that you wouldn't have found on your own. So even though you're not there in person seeing them every day, I've been surprised like going down these little wormholes of this person posted about a conference. Oh, I've liked what she posts. I'm interested to see who she also is inspired by. Um, another way to connect is based on the type of practice you have or you want to have, and that it could be independent contracted, private practice, academics, employed, locums, and I think that those groups help give another perspective on what life could be like if you're thinking of a transition, which at some point we all are thinking of a transition, even if it's just when you're going from fellow to your first job, knowing kind of what the landscape is. Um, can really open your eyes to, oh, what should I think about when I'm 
going for, for this sort of life, when I'm planning that this might be the path I wanna go down, what are the questions I wanna ask and, and who should I talk to about that? Well, maybe someone who's already in it that you might not know or might not have that connection with. Um, and if there's a group you're looking for and you can't find it, you could always just start one. It's really easy to just start it and then just say, hey, I'm looking to connect with people who are interested in X, Y, or Z, and then they come and then you just connect with them. Um, so that's the happy, like supporting the ups, but also supporting the downs is really important as well. And so in going through a life stressor, it's very easy to internalize, to live looking to yourself, to answer the questions and only relying on yourself. And then you're disappointed that you can't figure it out when you feel like you should be able to. Um, like this should be figure outable on your own. So if you can think of a question that you've been having or an issue that comes to mind that, that you're concerned you might be the only one going through, what I found on these groups is someone would, would post something like that. And then a whole bunch of people would chime in and say, you know what, you just, you've written the things that I've been thinking, or, you know, I've been through this before, here's how I got through it. Um, and if you're seeing someone posting that, and you've been there, then it's like, oh, you want to help, of course, with your experience that you might have had. You want to say, oh, I've been there. And that that was really helpful for me a couple of times when it really felt like, oh, I've got to be the only person going through this that I know and can connect to. Um, the good thing about social media is that you can explore silently. You can just like go and and look in the background, like not say anything, not comment. You can comment or you can comment anonymously or you can be named. If you're brave and don't care, you can, you can go ahead and just identify yourself and that can allow people to connect to you as well. Um, so a couple of the groups that I've seen are grief and bereavement groups like loss of pregnancy or child, loss due to addiction, loss due to suicide or any loss in general, support groups for those going through divorce, experiencing or who have experienced domestic violence who have, uh, with people who have anxiety or depression or married to people who have anxiety and depression. Um, and some of these groups offer small recurring support groups, which I think is really helpful as well. Um, so it's just really amazing what you can share and learn on these platforms. And it's kind of superficial. You have to put some effort into getting it to go on onto a deeper level. But at some point, it's good to know that just to normalize and to bring some awareness. And I think that that's the first part to acknowledging there's more to explore. And so go ahead, post your problems, your questions, your curiosities, and kind of see, see what comes back to you. Um, the end result is basically you're not alone. And if you find someone who kind of, you kind of are interested in, just go ahead. I'm sure they'd be delighted to hear from you and like build that connection. And if you live close enough, you can even meet them in real life. So you know, that's how you can take social media and the internet and kind of build it into what you can experience more in the physical present. So, so that's, that's my experience with social media. And, and I hope that you guys have explored too. And I'd be excited to hear about what social media has done for you and how it's helped to support you. There may be situations that you don't want to talk about with your friends or your family. You kind of want to be anonymous and curious and just um, explore in that manner. And I found that social media has been a good way to, to get into that. Thanks so much, Ileana.